talk with some experts about some of the deeper ethical, moral, and philosophical questions concerning this thing called artificial intelligence. Um, this is Chris Thorison, who's from Iceland. He um, has been focusing on AI for 30 years. He um, runs the Icelandic Institute for Intelligent Machines, professor of computer science at Reykjavik University. Um, but also has been an entrepreneur, so he's seen both theoretical and the application sides. Among other things, he's worked with Honda's Asimo, which hasn't yet taken over the world, but you know how to build constraints into systems and the opportunities. Um, Carly Kind is running a new institute in the UK called the Ada Lovelace Institute, um, which is working to make sure that artificial intelligence and data analytics um, are working in the public interest are on our side, um, looking at everything from biometrics to face recognition, um, formerly um, working in privacy law and data protection law. And then Massimo Pellegrino here, um, is from the corporate side. He's a partner at PwC in Italy, who's in charge of um, new ventures, but also responsible for the ethical, legal, and governance framework of their AI strategy. He's got a background in data and AI. Um, but I want to get a sense, firstly, of what is obsessing our team who are thinking about these questions. Um, so I'm gonna start with Carly, who you're relatively new in this organization. You've decided not to take government money or corporate money, so you've got a research grant. You've got a team of half a dozen. Day by day, what are the things top of mind? There's two things that I'm thinking about at the moment. <clears throat> One is uh, as a result of a book I read recently called The Technology Trap, which looks at how the similarities between the first industrial revolution and the current digital revolution. And one of the takeaways from that book is that revolutions, such as the one we're undergoing at the moment, the benefits of them are rarely felt by the generation uh, that experience it. In fact, the benefits are often delayed to future generations. And as a result, you see backlash. You see, in the current uh, context, tech clash. You see public unrest, public dissatisfaction. So how do we ensure that the benefits of this digital revolution um, accrue to those who are experiencing it and undergoing it at the moment? So that's one of the things I'm thinking about. And the second thing I'm thinking about is um, what does uh, changes in technology mean for societal values? David, you mentioned it in your speech earlier. You know, what are our society's values and how do technologies challenge or reinforce those values? And some of the ones that uh, uh, have come up for already today are things such as human agency or solidarity, community, equity and diversity. Do we need new social values or do we need technologies to reinforce and redefine and, and further um, respect? existing social values. So those are some of the things that we're grappling with as we set up the Ada Lovelace Institute. And when you talk about the backlash, are we talking specifically about people losing their jobs? I think that's part of it. I think public distrust in technologies, public distrust in the media, for example. We've seen you know, rapid advancement of communication technologies. We've seen a number of things develop like fake news uh, deep fakes that you gave some great examples of. And as a result, we've seen declining public trust in mass media, and that filters out to all sorts of things, including public trust in democratic institutions. Um, these technologies should be exciting us, they should be making our lives better, but people have the sense that their lives aren't getting better, they're getting more uncertain, uh, their jobs are on the line, they can't trust government, they can't trust the media. So how do we uh, build like, the legitimacy of these technologies for the public and ensure that they actually trust and, and are excited about technological developments? It does seem there's a time lag, as you suggest, between the benefits, potentially, of these technologies and the way that's received by the wider public. Um, 
there's a lot of people doing jobs that are not much fun. It's not much fun driving a truck across a continent, and autonomous driving will do that job, and those people will be retrained to do things possibly more satisfying. Um, but there's nobody saying to these people in the interim, we're going to take care of you, we're going to give you that education. I think that's part of the problem, but I mean, you say it's not very much fun driving a truck. It may be very integral to that person's identity that they're a truck driver. I suspect that truck driving as a, as a domain has a very strong community and people really associate with being a truck driver. So uh, beyond what is that person going to do for work and for income, how are they going to have an identity? How are they going to redefine what their social purpose is in the world if they're told you don't need to drive a truck anymore, you know, you can have any number of other more luxurious jobs. Is that what they want? Do they feel like they are still contributing to society? And I think that's even more fundamentally problematic than the retraining angle, which is, you're, you're not wrong, it, retraining these people for other jobs is part of the challenge, but also working out how they, it impacts their kind of sense of identity and social purpose, I think, is a, is a more fundamental challenge. And it's difficult to imagine how governments or companies alone can grapple with that challenge. I think it needs to be a much more integrated conversation with, whereby the public and the public interest is, is kind of first and foremost in conversations about those and issues. Why did you decide um, that the Ada Lovelace Institute should be independent of these big companies and of government? You touched on a little bit in your speech, David, which is you spoke about this kind of phenomenon of ethics washing. Um, I think it's quite problematic that uh, ethics is being co-opted um, by some in the private sector and in government, to be fair, to act as a kind of catch-all term for we're doing good without um, without there being anything there to back it up, any process, any demonstrable um, evaluation of impacts of technologies, etc. Um, simply establishing an ethics council or an ethics code of conduct, hopefully Chris can talk about his experiences in this regard, doesn't necessarily mean you're doing good as a company or as a government. Um, so uh, I think that term is being slightly co-opted. and linked to that is that there is a lot of private sector funding going into ethics conversations, into ethics bodies. Facebook, for example, has just given a huge grant to an institute in Germany to set up an ethics uh, research institute. And I think companies should be doing that, but I do think that having independent actors on the scene is equally important for a, a dynamic conversation. Um, there needs to be a body who speaks only on behalf of the public interest. Chris, do you trust these corporates to give money for independent research? Um, to some extent, but I think there always has to be um, oversight. And of course, uh, we, we should not let the, the wolves guard the hen house, that's for sure. Um, and, and, you know, the, the idea of setting up uh, sort of mutual uh, monitoring mechanisms uh, in society is, I think, integral uh, to, to a balanced society and to, to democracy. So what does the Icelandic Institute for Intelligent Machines do? So, so Triple M is, is pretty much like, uh, like Digital Hub Denmark, um, uh, with a special focus on the cutting edge uh, technologies of automation. And, so, uh, and if you're familiar with DFKI in Germany, who celebrated their 30th anniversary last year. Um, so we're a little bit behind Germany on these things, but, uh, but basically, um, the, uh, the society is, is when governments are recognizing now that in, in order to, to uh, deal with the rapid increase in speed and deployment of new technologies, there has to be more uh, focused and, and controlled effort in how that's done. And so it's about economic payoff, actually, in, in part, because uh, you have these, uh, these grants from, uh, from industry for basic research, and that results in, typically in papers and you know, maybe a few demonstrations, but that, that work can sit on a shelf and unless someone from industry happens upon a paper you know, and realizes how that could be used seven years from now, uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to disappear into the ether. So, so, um, so this effort of, of uh, strategically linking projects and needs, outcomes from uh, academia and needs of industry, and, and trying to, to bridge that with, uh, with mostly with prototypes and sort of honing down of, of the original Blue Sky ideas. So what's keeping you awake at night? What is obsessing you? 
Well, you know, I got interested in AI when I was 12. I didn't know the term at the time. Um, it had already been coined, but I sort of saw, uh, you know, when I'm in my mid-20s, you know, we'll have robots do everything. So I, I might be able to work a little bit on that cool idea, but, you know, probably it'll all be solved before I'm educated enough to do it. Uh, and, and we're still not there, so I'm, I'm kind of excited. And what keeps me awake is, is all of the, because, you know, in, in my, uh, uh, naive youth, I thought, you know, of course we're going to do that. Of course we're going to have machines do all of the stuff that we don't want to do ourselves. And then we ha can have a choice of what, what else we want to spend our time on. Uh, but uh, all of the unforeseen um, issues that are cropping up that uh, were very hard to foresee. I mean, the, side, the negative side effects, there's, there's a lot of them. Which ones specifically are bothering you most? Um, yeah, I, I just got back from China, and uh, you know it's hard not to to think about that. You know, I was watching BBC every hotel uh, we were in uh, when the protest in Hong Kong came up. Within 30 seconds, uh, typically much less, uh, the screen went blank. Uh, so it's a very, very blatant reminder. And, and they don't really. I mean, it's really weird because they they turn off this screen, and it's like okay. So everyone sees they're turning off the screen when the BBC is reporting from Hong Kong. So they don't want anyone to know. So surely the, the Chinese people, uh, you know, can go somewhere else to find that information. But I realized it's not, that's not really the purpose. The purpose is like, we can do what the hell we want. And they're using massive amounts of AI to, to enable this. But they also have employed, I think, more than half the population of Iceland to sit there and monitor the internet and television newscasts and so on. Abuse, you know, blatant abuse. There's, of course, other more benign ones, but this is the one that scares me the most. So, Massimo, um, you're thinking about how a commercial entity like PwC can both use artificial intelligence to help its clients, but the constraints you need to build in to the system to do it in the right way. Um, give some examples of how. PwC is working with clients using AI, and then maybe we can talk about some of the things you wouldn't do. Yeah, uh, we work with our clients in uh, almost uh, any area with, uh, with regard to AI, from uh, manufacturing with uh, digital twins uh, to uh, chatbots, uh, virtual assistants, uh, um, any kind of uh, advanced analytics uh, with machine learning uh, to uh, more sophisticated uh, AI applications, especially in uh, financial services, uh, uh, industrial products, uh, retail, uh, consumer goods, almost uh, in any industry. But uh, we uh, decided to uh, develop a program specific, specifically for AI ethics, because uh, if on the one hand uh, we, um, we are uh, certain about the opportunities uh, with AI applications. As you said, there is not much fun uh, driving a truck, although there is a community of, of uh, people that enjoy to, uh, to be from their identity viewpoint a, a truck driver. But there are uh, things that uh, unintentionally AI application can do. Because basically, I think that we have two categories of problems with regard to AI ethics. On the one hand, we have uh, the final goal of a specific AI application, like uh, you know the case in China. So they want to control their people uh, through AI applications. On the other hand, especially because of the use of machine learning algorithms, you can have AI applications that unintentionally can cause, for instance, discrimination, which is one of the main examples. We are very much focused on, on the latter, right? So we need to, uh, we want to find a way to manage risks for companies that are developing AI applications, but of course don't have any uh, um, um, uh, malevolent uh, intention in terms of, uh, you know, what they want to do with AI, AI, AI applications. So, and uh, for me, there are two things uh, that are uh, really important. Uh, on the one hand, uh, 
you need to uh, define or identify the ethical principles uh, you want to follow. In this area, I think that uh, the debate uh, is pretty mature, especially, especially at the European level. So the, the EU is very much aware about uh, AI ethics. Um, they uh, appointed uh, an AI expert group that uh, issued recently a paper with uh, their guidelines about uh, AI ethics. And there are a number of initiatives at the EU level uh, that uh, work in this direction. But on the other hand, what uh, keeps me awake at night is to make them, I mean, uh, the AI principles uh, operational. So how can you translate uh, the principles you want to follow about uh, fairness and uh, interpretability and explainability, human agency, in something that is uh, really pragmatic? And basically, you have two possible ways. Uh, the first one is uh, computational ethics. So basically, you can do that with other technologies. And it is a bit weird, because you want to control algorithms with other algorithms. So basically, there are algorithms or machine learning algorithms that can detect discrimination in other algorithms. And the other way to do, it, to do, to do that is through governance. So you have to set up the right governance process to be certain that the whole life cycle of AI development is monitored, right? From AI strategy, so what you want to do, all the way down to maintenance, right? And development and how you buy from third parties AI applications, which is a a very big problem, of course, because uh, you cannot get access uh, to the code, uh, and uh, you have to figure out other mechanisms uh, to control what they are doing. So it, it is a very complex and multidisciplinary endeavor that is, uh, in my view, particularly important. So we're talking about this thing called ethics, like it's something very well understood and everybody agrees what it is. Um, but I think we need to drill down into what we won't do if we're following an ethical code. Give me a couple of examples, Massimo, of things that you won't do under PwC's ethical code. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that uh, the number of uh, ethical codes that are out there is impressive. We um, uh, went through 100 plus code of conduct. Uh, from uh, universities and uh, uh, labs uh, and companies like Google and Amazon. So I don't think that uh, now it, the, 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 the number of principles uh, uh, crystallized, and there are basically five or six uh, main principles uh, that have been accepted. Share a couple of them. Fairness, which is about uh, discrimination interpretability and explainability, which has to do with the right to the truth. So basically the right for uh, anyone, for any citizen, to know how an AI application is working. Uh, human agency, which is the other one. Uh, data privacy is probably the fifth one. And uh, around those principles, at least uh, as far as companies, uh, are concerned, you can work out your uh, AI ethics strategy, and as a consequence, uh, the, the uh, implementation plan, uh, which I was referring to when I spoke about uh, computational ethics. Carly, you hear these companies talk about these things that they will and won't do. Is it enough just declaring the framework? I think it's an, an excellent starting point. I worry that it focuses too much on what we want the technology to be rather than what we want our society to be. So I completely agree with Massimo that fairness, privacy, uh, agency, etc. are 
uh, excellent kind of structures that we should um, measure technologies against. But they don't necessarily answer the question of, but how is this going to change how we live and do we want that outcome? So a, a good example might be facial recognition technology. Of course, it's quite a kind of buzz um, tech at the moment. Everybody's talking about it. And that's because I think it's, it's like a very evocative uh, um, uh, realization of, of some of these um, new technologies. Um, if we can make facial recognition technology fair so that it doesn't discriminate against people of color and women, which it does at the moment, if we can make sure that it's uh, built on the basis of data sets which respect data privacy, um, if we can make it accountable, if uh, we can factor in some of those concerns around human agency, Nevertheless, do we want societies in which facial recognition technology is everywhere? How is it going to change our relationship with the state? How is it going to change our relationship with each other? How does it normalize surveillance? And how does the normalization of surveillance ha hamper creativity or um, radical ideas or uh, progressive movements? And I think there's that broader question of not just what technology do we want to see, but what society do we want to see. I, I think it's an impossible question for companies to answer themselves. And I think the starting point is, what do we want the technology to look like? But that broader conversation has to be something that we all have together. So if you had in the room the heads of some of our biggest listed companies, what would you ask them to do? I think I would say, let's not use society as a, a test bed for technologies that we're not sure yet how they're going to change society. Let's try to think through some of these issues and essentially move slower and fix things rather than move fast and break things. Let's slow things down a bit before we actually roll out some of this stuff so that we do actually understand the societal impact before we forge ahead. I think rolling back is really difficult thing to do. It requires, you know, we've seen it around the kind of data protection uh, field of regulation where uh, technology moved much faster than regulation could move. So all these companies went ahead and started doing all these practices. Now we have things like the GDPR that's trying to crawl some of that back and it's very difficult actually. So I suppose what I would urge them to do is to move more slowly. I realize that's kind of anathema to many companies and in particular to the tech sector, which prize innovation and speed over um, thoughtful, slow um, uh, testing and reiteration. But nevertheless, I think what's at stake is so uh, vast and, and problemsome that I think we need to take things a little slower. Yeah, I, I think I completely agree and I think, you know, uh, of course, everyone wants to be at the cutting edge or even the bleeding edge, and so they want to, you know, that goes from, from everything to, from uh, universities up to companies to governments, etc. Uh, and, and they think, you know, artificial intelligence is the next thing. But we're actually in the, in the age of artificial stupidity, in my opinion. Uh, the idea of having a, a machine that you can't really, really trust uh, oversee another machine that you can't really trust is just... Um, silly idea, frankly. Uh, what we need to get to, and I'm, I'm a uh, technology developer, so you know, I, I'm not an ethics lawyer, so I, you know, I do like to think big and, and uh, what kind of society we want to live in, etc. I think uh, democracy is, is a pretty good idea. But, um, uh, so I, but I've been focusing a lot on, in the last decade on uh, machines that can, uh, can self-reflect. And I think the only way to really get to uh, you used uh, the word understanding a lot in your uh, talking about AI. And, and it used to be that people put understanding in quotation marks when they talked about it in the context of AI. You can look at the literature, actually. I did a, did a study of this. Um, when it comes down to it, these machines don't really understand anything, and that's the problem. One of the issues that keeps hitting the big tech companies is opposition by their staff to working for government, particularly military parts of the government. Yet, if we look back at some of the great tech innovations of the last century, it's often been the military that invest and create things like GPS, like radar, that we all rely on. So Chris, is there a problem in itself in companies helping the military with their machine intelligence. Yeah, yeah, I think that diverts. So his, his, historically, um, 
military funds have an advantage over the rest of society because of the history of, of the, the funding. And uh, the, the problem is that there's a bias then uh, for, for new AI researchers who think, you know, well, we're going to have to, if we want to get big funds, we, we have to go to the military. And, and that means basically building technologies that are, per, that are specifically designed to track, intimidate, and kill people. And I think most people will have uh, some, at some level a problem with that. Uh, and certainly, uh, I have had that for a long time. And I, I think that there, uh, this diverts the attention of research uh, and development to uh, away from the good applications, in fact, which I think are vastly more numerous. Carly, does the Lovelace Institute have a problem with military research? I think it's, to be honest, David, I think it's a, it, it's, it's a distraction to focus solely on military applications of AI and technology. I, I think it's very problematic and, it, and I think it's good that tech workers are taking a stance on this, but um, I also think that you know, technology developed in the private sector, even independently of government, can one day be acquired by government, can one day be acquired by the military. So whether or not a company works with military directly um, doesn't necessarily stop that tech from later being acquired. I think that other government um, development of tech can be problematic as well. I was just reading James Lovelock's new book, uh, Novacine, and he was talking about working for NASA um, in the 60s, uh, developing space technologies, and the realization that that was actually being used for the development of nuclear weapons as well. And as a, a, a kind of NASA scientist, that you know, realization that the tech you're developing for one purpose can later be used for another. So I don't feel like there's a clear, bright line between we're either developing military tech or we're not. I, I think that there's all of these technologies can be used around, uh, across a, a large range of applications. So you have to, I think, foresee the consequences um, in all different applications and not necessarily just draw a line that we're not working with military. I don't think that's sufficient. So there's a lot of people here running businesses some startups, some bigger companies. Do you think they have a responsibility to publicly declare their ethical policy? Should they have a page on their website that's their ethical code of conduct? Absolutely. Yes, I think so. Because it's um, <clears throat> really important to understand their attitude towards uh, AI ethics. Um, and again, uh, I. <laughs> I want to be very pragmatic, so I completely acknowledge what you said about the broader picture, so I'm not advocating uh, computational ethics as the only means to deal with AI ethics. But on the other end, especially in the private sector, you have to do something, right? Because uh, uh, AI, 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 artificial intelligence, is a competitive uh, uh, thing that they must use to be you know, even more competitive in the future. But on the other end, as I said, there are unintentional consequences that they need to at least monitor. But if they want to do that, they need to be aware of the possible risks they are running in terms of AI ethics. So GDPR, for instance, is helping very much uh, these companies because uh, it forces them to, to, uh, to, uh, to pay attention to some aspects that are very important. So, for instance, uh, interpretability, the right to the truth that I mentioned earlier on. So, if uh, they want to be ethically aware, they need to say, well, you dear Mr. Customer, or uh, you government, or anybody, any stakeholder of the, the broader AI community, have the possibility to understand how my uh, artificial intelligence applications work, which doesn't mean uh, you know, getting access to the code, of course. Uh, there are a, a number of things that can be done from a logical perspective, for instance, uh, through adversarial attacks, that can be uh, used to explain how an, a, an algorithm works, uh, protecting uh, IP, protecting uh, the intellectual property. On the other end, again, especially with regard to bias, fairness, uh, and uh, human agency, a, a uh, 
contained uh, code of conduct, uh, I mean very focused, very specific, uh, in my view, would help a lot. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's important. And um, so on, on my considerations of, of the military in 2015, AAAM put out um, an ethics policy that was strictly focused on uh, the military. In fact, I think we should extend it to, uh, to, to basically cover uh, more broadly just any abuse or violation of human rights. Actually, I do think it says so. So this was in 2015. I, I believe we were the first uh, AI research lab to have an explicit policy. And I, I, I urged the, the folks at DFKI to do so, and they convinced me that, well, they're pretty much following the same rules, but they don't say it explicitly. Uh, and I'm hoping that they will sooner rather than later, and, and, and more labs. And okay. there was, a, uh, I think it's ClearPath Robotics that uh, in Canada that around the same time, uh, I think also that was in 2015, was the first robotics company to say explicitly they would not work on, on uh, uh, weapons. So I want to look a little bit into the future because this area is moving very quickly and whatever we're talking about now is going to be irrelevant by the time we get off the stage. Um, where do you all see the next level of um, concern, the threats of some of these emerging technologies, what's going to follow concern about face recognition, maybe in a five-year framework? If I think slightly beyond that, there are two things that I think about these are slightly longer term. One is the environmental impact of AI technologies. I think that there's a lot of focus at the moment about how AI is going to solve climate change and not very much conversation going on about how it's going to contribute to climate change. For example? Well, there has been recent studies which show that training up a single neural network um, has the same, has a much larger carbon footprint uh, than a, a single car does in the course of its life. And um, it's very difficult, I think, to equate uh, carbon outputs um, when it, because the AI ecosystem and supply chain is so large and, and varied, but um, <clears throat> I do think that uh, if we think about a world in which machines are kind of paramount and everywhere, um, how are we going to make sure that that's also a sustainable future? And, and I, I think it's just worth that conversation happening now. The other thing I'm thinking about longer term is taxation and the distribution of the financial benefits of AI, um, and how can we... Um, if, if the truck driver example that you gave, if, if we do get to a point in which a large percentage of labor is replaced by machines, um, how do we distribute the financial benefits of that? Um, is it through taxation? Is it through universal basic income? Are there other um, economic me mechanisms that we can look to? So those are kind of longer term future things about societal impact. Well, I guess there's a small number of companies acquiring most of the talent and there's a bidding war for the few thousand people who are specialists in the field and yeah. salaries are going up, I guess there is a risk that if you're not in one of those big companies, you're going to be commercially disadvantaged. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, and, and I think that question also around AI talent is a, not, is a sustainability question in, in some respects as well, because I, there's, uh, as you alluded to, big tech companies are acquiring most of the AI talent, and that's impeding those same people going into potentially public interest tech development or government AI um, expertise. So um, how sustainable is the, uh, the pipeline, I suppose, is another uh, question we need to think about longer term. Chris, what are we going to be worrying about? Well, you know, Norbert Wiener wrote a remarkable book in 1950 called The Human Use of Human Beings, um, where he foresaw uh, much of what's happening. Um, the, the trend towards an Orwellian future, I think, is something that all democracies would will need to seriously look into. Um, and I would throw in uh, a, a pet peeve of mine that is not very much talked about, which is the size of companies. Uh, you know, there's been, there's a history of talking about the size of government and, and limiting its reach into people's lives. And I really do think we need to have that same conversation about companies. Massimo, <laughs> put on your futurist hat. What's going to be the next debate? <coughs> For me, what is um, really 
important to start discussing now is artificial general intelligence. I'm not saying that we'll get there, because of course it is impossible to say now, but there is a, a pretty significant uh, part of the scientific community that is almost certain that we'll get to that point. And this would represent a completely different game. They talk about uh, the existential risk. That is a completely different thing. It is not about uh, AI ethics anymore. It is about uh, a world with a different type of intelligence that is not necessarily similar to ours, right? And the, uh, the possible um, impacts in terms of uh, social interactions, uh, threats to democracy, um, but also in terms of our own uh, um, existential meaning is uh, unbelievably important. So starting to discuss about that now can give us a couple of uh, advantages. First of all, we can have a better view about uh, um, the current risks of artificial intelligence because I am certain that uh, even if we don't reach that point, uh, we don't get to artificial general intelligence, uh, there, there could be an asymptotic uh, curve to that point uh, where the possible impacts are almost the same, right? So starting now is very important. Uh, and then, of course, if it happens, <laughs> we would be prepared. It's not that there isn't research money going into these discussions. I mean, Elon Musk, Jan Talin are funding organizations like the Future of Life Institute, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Um, what's so bad about artificial general intelligence? Why should we be worried? I, I have to disagree slightly, Massimo. I find some of that conversation, again, a diversion from the real risk that we face now. It's really hard to know because, first of all, I think uh, the expertise is concentrate, concentrated in so few minds around AGI that um, depending on who you speak to, it's either happening in five years or it's never happening. And it's, um, I mean, my experience is listening to podcasts on this and I, one day I'm convinced it's happening in five years and we're all going to uh, be L uploading Same our for brains. And, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I find it very difficult to kind of get to the bottom of the truth and so my default is to just focus on the current, you know, the tangible risk in the next few years. Uh, in terms of why would it be so bad, um, I, I mean, I do agree with Massimo that it would, it be, would just be a fundamental shift about how we conceive of ourselves as uh, humans and, and what it means to relate to other forms of intelligence. I'm not sure how much preparation we can do for that. Now, I, in terms of tangible steps, I do think that diversifying the workforce and the expertise that is working on artificial general intelligence may prime it for being a better outcome. That is, if we only have people that talk and look like Elon Musk and others in Silicon Valley thinking about this and developing this tech, then we're sure to create an AGI that is more problematic than if we have a much more diverse workforce, we ensure kind of diversity of gender and race and background and lived experiences and not people that live in a Silicon Valley bubble, then I think we're more likely to end up with an AGI that is more consistent with kind of broader societal values. So the well, I might have some thoughts on that because I've devoted my professional career in thinking about AGI. Now, it used, didn't used to be called AGI because, you know, for the first two-thirds of my professional work, uh, AI was AGI. And, and it took me a while to realize that, it, that what, what everyone was doing and called AI wasn't actually AGI. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, there's a lot of silly ideas floating around about AGI that are based on our current AI that aren't going to be around when AGI comes around. And it, it, it is going to come so around. What is the risk? The risk, I think, in, in thinking about the risk, the best way to start that discussion, which I wholeheartedly support, is to uh, think of an analogy to society and think of because we already have AGIs, that's, you know, the, the gold standard for AGI is this, the human mind. So it's in some aspects going to have very uh, similarities to that. There's, there's going to be similar risks associated with AGI, AGI as there are risks associated with people. And we, you know, we have systems like prisons and we have the, the, the judiciary system and everything, and, you know, 
a lot of those rules are going to, uh, a lot of those mechanisms are not going to work for machines that are at that level, but a lot of the issues are going to be the same. Uh, also, don't forget, uh, machines will always need energy. And so at that inflection point, we, there will be a way, just like you can track uh, nuclear uh, uh, efforts nu in nuclear power uh, and nuclear weapons, there will be methods for tracking the potential risks. So if there's a rogue state that's doing something with AGIs, uh, there, there will have to be regulations and, and new rules that will, for that specifically, but it will kind of bear a resemblance. We'll recognize it sort of because we already know it from the current societies. I it's want the to value leave. We have, the we have um, one final quick question. We've a very curious, intelligent, well connected group of people in the room. We can start quite a useful conversation in the breaks today. I'd like you all to, from an ethical framework, from a philosophical framework, suggest an idea to leave the room with, something that people should start thinking about now that relates to the power, to the potential of the machine. And we've talked about what it's going to mean for jobs, for equity in society, for the role of government. But is there a final thought that people here can reflect on today? I, I would, my challenge, I suppose, in particular to startups would be to think about how you could bring real people in to understand and, and learn about your technology and kind of test some of the values that it, it is inherent in that tech. I mean, I'm really interested in this, the, the potential for different forms of public engagement and public consultation. And it's more relevant, I think, for government deployment of tech, but I do think it could potentially be a useful methodology for the private sector as well. Part of it's, you know, essentially focus group testing, but, you know, can you talk to the public about your technology? Can you understand how they feel about various elements of it and what it's going to do to their lives? And can you feed that back into your own ethics policies? That would be one challenge I would put up. Briefly, Massimo. I completely agree with you. It's probably the most important thing. I mean, they need to engage with their community of uh, users or, or uh, stakeholders because uh, if they develop uh, their AI application in a sort of uh, ivory tower, mm. they miss an opportunity to test out uh, what is uh, really important uh, for their users. And uh, my, my final point is about the contextualization process they need to put in place. Ethics uh, is not rocket science. Right? It is a cultural thing, and uh, they need uh, to uh, understand what is uh, relevant uh, from an ethical viewpoint uh, in the community where they live uh, or in the community where they do business with. That, that's, for me, the most important thing. You have 30 seconds, Chris, to send us away yeah. with some reflectiveness. Yeah, so I think it's my final thought, and so, since I used the six seconds now, I'm, I'm try, I'll try to <laughs> hurry. Um, we really need to think on all levels broadly how we can ha make this technology benefit everyone and not be collected at the hands of a very few. Thank you, team. Thank you for everybody here for joining us in this philosophical communion. Massimo, Chris, Carly. Thank you.